This was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Jim, the English teacher. I have a big cat question. Why did Ernie never settle in a major promotion, either WWF or Crockett NWA? As a kid growing up in the Northeast in the late 70s, early 1980s, my only exposure to Ernie was as a commentator in the WWF around 1985 or 1986. I know Korn rubbed elbows with Ladd <laughs> and just wondered why. Why wouldn't Ernie Ladd be, I guess, why wouldn't he have a major run? Wouldn't he have been a phenomenal NWA champ? Well, I'm not even sure I understand the question because Ernie Ladd had multitudes of phenomenal runs. He is, is he saying because he never was the NWA champion or because he never he, homesteaded? It, well, he didn't want to. He uh, here was the thing, and and later in in his career, when he was booking as well as working, like he was booking in in Mid South, he booked for a while in uh, for Crockett in the Carolinas. Uh, they he booked in uh, Florida. Um, he would stay there longer because he was the booker as well as a talent. But uh, for so much of his career, he didn't work one territory at a time. He worked several. He didn't. You didn't see Ernie Ladd you know, wherever he was working the spot shows. If he was in the a fucking Carolina territory, you still didn't see him in, in goddamn Goose Creek, South Carolina a lot because he was in demand, especially in the 70s. He was working the big towns for Bruiser in Indiana, be Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, <clears throat> Chicago. And then at the same time, he might be working Buffalo and Cleveland for Pedro Martinez. And he might be going in and out of Texas because he was huge in Texas. Because he played football and he was from Texas, played football in Houston. Um, so I mean, he you would see him pop up in Los Angeles. He'd have a run out there where he'd get on the LA TV and you know work the Olympic Auditorium shows as the America's Champion or whatever. At the same time, he might be flying back and forth to make you know Madison Square Garden shots or big Northeastern stuff. So you weren't seeing him in Modesto, you know, at the Uptown Arena all that much. So uh, nobody ever considered Ernie for the NWA champion because he didn't fit the style and I don't think he would have wanted it. He probably made a lot, uh, I won't say a lot more money than the NWA champion, but he made a, a very good living calling his own shots, booking his own dates and doing what he wanted to do rather than, you know, give up his entire life. And then Ernie's body would not have taken the style, uh, he, you know, even when he was, when he was on top in wrestling in the seventies, he still had bad knees because of football and because of his height. And he still took back drops and, and did the drop kicks and took good bumps. But, um, to work as NWA champion seven nights a week for fucking two or three years would have killed him physically. So no, there was, he wouldn't want it. Nobody ever thought he, he would take it. Plus in a lot of ways, when you think of the 1970s, who defines a wrestling free agent? More than Ernie Ladd. Yeah. He, he wrestled for opposite. He wrestled for All South in opposition in Georgia. He wrestled for Eddie Einhorn and Pedro Martinez's IWA. He was the king of wrestling there. Of course, him and Billy Graham and Ivan Koloff, the trifecta. Yeah. Demanding main event paydays from Vince McMahon Sr. and getting it. Well, and, and let's explain for, for the new folks. Um, at the time, superstar Billy Graham, Ernie Ladd, and Ivan Koloff were the three top heels in the WWWF, and they could be rotated in against uh, at first Pedro and then Bruno for the for the title, and they would all draw. And they got together. It was kind of collective bargaining, which never happened, especially back in those days. But they went to Vince Senior and said, "We are." your heel crew. And even if one of us is in the title match or the main event, the other ones are drawn on the card. So we all want, the, when we're on the same card, we want the same pay regardless where we are on the match lineup and got it because they were so, they were right. They were so fucking over and so strong. So no, Ern, Ernie did not go to a territory and work every night because he was being since the fucking late sixties, right? Being flown around to a variety of places. Hey, I told you about this off air recently, but, uh, I didn't know the exact quote. I found it in the book here. I recently told Mike Mills about this on the mid South wrestling podcast. This is from Atlas too much too soon by Scott Teal and Tony Atlas. 
Uh, when I was wrestling in Oklahoma for Bill Watts, Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Matt Bourne got into a major fight. Bourne's girlfriend left him, claiming he had been beating her. A short time later, she began dating Hacksaw. Bourne beat her up again. When Bourne came into the dressing room that night, he walked right up to Hacksaw. <laughs> Words were exchanged, and they began to fight. Ernie Ladd, who worked for Watts, stepped between them to separate them. I thought I was watching a scene from The Wizard of Oz where Dorothy threw the bucket of water on the witch. <laughs> Ernie's knees gave out on him. They began to buckle, and he slowly sank to the ground. As he went down, he was screaming, Tony Atlas, keep these two away from each other. <laughs> and the punchline of the story is later on, Grizzly Smith chewed out both Ernie and me for breaking up the fight. He said if Watts had been there, he would have fired both of us for breaking it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, God, I can believe it. Tony Atlas, keep these two away from each other. Oh my God! Yeah, that uh, Ernie used to come in. Uh, you know, when when we were there in Mid South, he had been the Booker the year before, and then he moved to Carolinas when we came in, and Dundee took the book, and he was helping with the book in in the Carolinas. But then he came back for some shots that summer, and so he got to team with the Midnight and Six Man. So I got to manage Ernie Lad. We got to sit in the locker room with him. Uh, you know, just hear some of the wisdom. But especially down in Lafayette, which he lived in Franklin, Louisiana at the time, Louisiana at the time, and it was down south. So Lafayette was real close to his house. He'd come in about 15 minutes before bell time, right? And he'd come in carrying his bag, and his knees were real bad at that point, right? And they looked like grapes on a toothpick. And he even when he was walking regularly, they would always be bent. He always kept them a little bit bent. And, but he was so huge, even though he was bent over a little bit, he still towered over everybody. And he would come in the back door carrying his bag in one hand and chewing on a piece of actual fresh sugar cane that he had just picked out in his backyard. And he sticks that in his mouth and he grabs a chair because as soon as he comes in and he sees the first folding chair, he grabs the back of it. And he's dragging that along with him also because he's <laughs> he's going to take it to wherever he decides to sit. And he finally, he drags the chair in. He leans on it because of his knees. He puts the bag down. He sits in the chair and he starts chewing on the sugar cane. And Ernie had arrived in the building. He would just, he was happy to be near home at that point, right? But uh, I, I can believe, and, and I also, Jesus Christ, Matt Bourne got in fights with every fucking body, didn't he? Were you around him at all? Um, just a couple of times when he was doink, you know, a short time when he was, when he was doink, uh, but no, he, he got the underage, you know, a minor issue complaint in Atlanta when they were going to push him and Arn as the new heel team in 83, which led to the birth of the road warriors. Cause only needed a fucking new heel team on one week's notice gets a fight. Well, what? I'm, I'm all respect to Matt Bourne. You got to have plenty of fucking confidence in yourself to want to fight Hacksaw Duggan in 1984, 1983, even 1983, even, even worse. Yeah. Right. You know, but there you have it. What's what's actually what's uh, when, when Butch Reed and, and John Nord, the barbarian fucking got into it in, in Oak city at the myriad Watts uh, basically said, stirred him up because they've been promoing it. And promoing it, right? And or as Butch Reed would say, selling wolf tickets, crying wolf about it, selling wolf tickets. And so Watts finally stirred him up, said, "If you're going to do it, do it." And they started at the fucking myriad, and boom, 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 and they're throwing the hammers at each other, beating the piss out of each other. And one of them grabbed a, a pipe or a pipe and drape rod or something that was laying there, and Watts ran in and grabbed that like a referee, like no, got to be <laughs> hand to hand. He took the fucking pipe away from him, and then boom, boom, they finally beat each other up for a little while, and then they were blowed up. And he said, "Okay." If y'all got it out of your system now, you got to go 15 to 20 tonight for the belt in the main event. Yeah, they booked and they the had to go out and, <laughs> yeah, and they had to go out and work with each other that night. Hey, you know, I wanted to ask you, uh, I never heard anyone confirm this, but I've heard the story from a few people. When they gave Ernie the North American title again for the last time at the end of 1984, and then they had him drop it to Brad Armstrong, who had just come in, was that intentionally because of Bill Watts wanting to utilize Armstrong in that position being on TBS? Um, well, I don't, those I were don't, the first shows that aired on TBS, even though it was a couple months after the fact, but he was obviously already working on the deal. You know, eh, I honestly don't know if it was the fact that 
because uh, it was TBS, it was all across the country. Uh, the Armstrong family was big in Georgia, but I think it was that he wanted to, he loved Brad Armstrong's work as everybody did. And he wanted to finally, cause a lot of people had been saying at that time, if, if, you know, if they just need to use Brad on top, somebody that can bring his personality out as well as his incredible work. And I think he wanted to do that regardless of whether it was TBS timing or whatever. And I can see why that because Ernie had such stature, no, not a rib. I'm not talking about his size, but stature in wrestling and uh, was viewed as such a top guy in people's eyes. He's fixing to retire. Watts wants him to make one guy. I'm sure he was all on board with, you know, cause I, I don't even remember the match right now. I'm sure I saw it at the time if it was on TV or whatever the fuck, but I'm sure he put Brad over like a million dollars because I'm sure he was all on board with it. They just wanted a big star right before he retired to make a new top baby face. But at that point, that's right about the same time that all of Watts' territory began having issues. So, uh, you know, I don't know that it worked that well. All throughout the 80s, everyone said, oh, Brad Armstrong, he's going to be great, but it never really happened. How come no one ever just said, why don't we turn him heel? Why don't we see if this works? You know, I don't know. <laughs> and maybe it just because it he was just the epitome of everything you would want in a baby face. As far as his body and his appearance and his uh, expressions and his work and his attitude and the person he was. And he was so fucking hilarious in in the locker room and in person. But he couldn't really be that that. Back in those days, especially, you couldn't really be that wise ass, you know, funny f- crack fucker as the top baby face. You had to, and he struggled with being serious, I guess, as far as the the top guy with the, you know, the the pressure put on him to be the guy. He wasn't, you know, his promos weren't they they were good, but it wasn't like Bullet Bob's. It wasn't like. You know, Road Dog got the promo, but he did, but Brad got the body. You know, Scott got probably the 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 business brains, but Brad got the work. They all got something different, a piece of Bullet Bob, but only Bullet Bob really had everything. 